Wir kommen jetzt zum letzten Beitrag. Ähm, dieser Dialekt wird uns näher bringen, wo die Gemeinsamkeiten und Unterschiede bestehen zwischen, zwischen einem westlichen Verständnis vom Feminismus und ähm, Konzepten der Frauenbefreiung, ähm, die in der kurdischen Bewegung diskutiert werden. Ja, vielen Dank dafür. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, before I begin, I would like to thank everyone in this uh, room and outside of this room, all of the translators, the organizers, the cooks, the cleaners, the security, the people who have welcomed us in their, fam in their homes. Thank you everyone for participating in this conference. <clears throat> And um, I'm, I think the resistance of Kobani, which we have all, uh, with all of our excitement, uh, have followed. And uh, we, we were just joined by three freedom fighters of the YPG who are fighting in Kobani against this so-called Islamic State. I think the fact that so many people have gathered here and that we're talking uh, about the Kurdish liberation movement and its approaches and its new ideas of how to concept conceptualize freedom and liberation, that we can discuss all of this here today with so many people from diverse backgrounds, I think is quite telling of the larger impacts of the Kobani resistance, which go far beyond the military aspects. So, um, the, and please tell me if I'm too quickly, because um, the translators are doing a great job. Uh, the World Women's March this year uh, was launched at the border between North and West Kurdistan, between the Kurdish areas within Turkish and Syrian borders, uh, at where the cities Kamishlo and Nusaybin meet. Uh, and they were greeting each other and the committee of the World's Women, World Women's March took the decision to start it there in order to salute the women who had been uh, fighting against uh, the Islamic State in Kobani. So this is just one of the many examples for why, how the, that illustrate the sudden interest of different feminist movements in the Kurdish uh, women's movement. And so, at this crucial period in time in which uh, Kurdish women contributed to re-articulation of uh, women's liberation uh, by rejecting to comply with the premises of the global capitalist patriarchal nation-state order by breaking the taboo of women's militancy because you know that women taking up arms is a taboo everywhere in the world because it breaks social boundaries. Um, by reclaiming legitimate self-defense and dissociating the monopoly of power from the state and fighting a brutal force not on behalf of imperialist forces but in order, in, yes, in order to create their own terms of liberation not only from fascist forces such as the Islamic State, but also from their own community. Uh, within all of that context, with that background, what can feminist movements learn from the experience of Kurdish women today? So, perhaps it is first of all important to mention that the Kurdish women's movement's relationship to feminism in the region has often been quite complicated. Uh, within the context of Turkey, for example, uh, Turkish feminists have, have had a tendency to marginalize uh, Kurdish women uh, because before they could participate in the feminist movement, they had first to be Turkish. Right, because the Turkish feminism of the state uh, necessitated the subscription to the nationalist state doctrine, which said every woman in this country is Turkish. So in that sense, uh, out of that context, the Kurdish women's movement emerged. And today, when we look at the ways in which the Western world is trying to treat the Kurdish women's resistance in Kobani, we also see, as some of the speakers have already elaborated, a very simplistic approach to it. The women's political motivations, their ideologies are just being uh, ignored within this context. But if we look deeper and try to investigate the reasons, the motivations behind these women's struggle, we will see uh, 
that the issue is far more complicated and in fact the ideology with which the women are fighting against ISIS is on the terrorist list of many uh, Western countries. So, when talking about feminism and the Kurdish liberation movement, I'm not implying that these are necessarily two different things that are opposing each other. That's not, the, the talk that I'm going to give is, should not be understood in that sense. I want to investigate the relationships and also the original approaches of the Kurdish women's movement that could also uh, provide lessons to other approaches perhaps and they can learn from each other. So, of course, there is not one single feminism. Uh, there are several strands of feminism uh, that have emerged during the course of history, and they often differ from each other. Um, but the specifics of the experience of the Kurdish women, which created direct lived consciousness of the fact that different forms of oppression are interrelated due to their spe specific position as members of a stateless nation as well as socioeconomic exclusion and um, being women in such a patriarchal feudal society. The previous speakers have elaborated on that. Um, you know, this lived direct consciousness of that fact as well as the Kurdish liberation movement's uh, critique of colonialism and the state perhaps suggest that anarchist, uh, socialist, post-colonial feminisms are closest to the Kurdish women's experience or at least have a lot of overlaps. Um, yet, while claiming feminism uh, as an important part of historical society um, and its legacy as a heritage, the discussions within the Kurdish women's movement um, today aim to investigate the limits uh, of feminism and in fact move beyond it. This is not the classical post-feminism argument at all. This, uh, it does not mean to reject feminism or argue that we live in a society where we don't need it. In fact, both concepts are seen as complementary. Moving beyond feminism does not mean to reject it. It means to systematize an alternative to the dominant system through a radical systemic critique and the communalization of the struggle, especially by politicizing the grassroots, causing a mental revolution, a transformation in the mentality of society, and figuratively killing the masculine, as well as questioning the entire global order within which this violence and oppression takes place. So I think we can very well take Kobani as an example of a practical implication, implementation of this because, as I will argue, the resistance that we saw displayed in Kobani where smiling women were fighting against the probably most fascist forces of our days has a lot to do with ideology and we must not forget that. The ways in which this movement con concer concer considers freedom uh, is the direct result we see in uh, Kobani. Um, Abdullah Öcalan explicitly states um, that capitalism, patriarchy, and the state lie at the roots of oppression, domination, and power. And he makes the connection between them quite clear. And I will just give a short quote. All the power and state ideologies stem from sexist attitudes and behavior. Without women's slavery, none of the other types of slavery can exist, let alone develop. Capitalism and nation-state denote the most institutionalized dominant male. More boldly and openly spoken, capitalism and nation-state are the monopolism of the despotic and exploitative male." End quote. This was a quote from Öcalan. The Kurdish liberation movement's outlook on women's liberation is of an explicitly communalist nature. Rather than rejecting men or deconstructing gender roles to infinity, it treats the conditions behind current concepts of womanhood as a sociological phenomenon and aims to redefine such concepts by um, formulating a new social contract. It criticizes mainstream feminism's common uh, 
analysis of sexism in terms of gender only, as well as its failure to achieve wider social change by limiting the struggle to the framework of the persisting order. Because one of feminism's, mainstream feminism's main tragedies is its falling into the trap of liberalism. So under the banner of liberation, extreme individualism and consumerism are often today propagated as emancipation and empowerment, uh, posing clear obstacles, of course, to collective action, to change the society, actually, to touch on the realities of society. And of course, individual liberties are crucial to democracy, but failure to mobilize in a grassroots collective manner requires a fundamental self-criticism of feminism. So the, term, the feminist term intersectionality of course underlines that forms of oppression are interlinked and that feminism needs to tackle these issues simultaneously in order to approach them. But quite often the feminist movements that engage in these debates fail to touch the real lives of millions of women that are affected. So that generates another a vacuumed discussion on radicalism that is completely inaccessible to most people. So how radical or intersectional can a struggle be if it does not spread, if it completely fails to spread? So these attitudes, um, according to the Kurdish women's movement, are often linked to the subscription to positivist science and uh, the relationship between knowledge and power which blurs the explicit links between forms of domination, thus eliminating the Okay, thus uh, eliminating the belief that a different world is possible by portraying the global order as the natural order of things. And we have already heard a couple of talks on this, how the system tries to create this image that the order in which we live in is as it is. This is human nature and no other system is possible. So... Um, Due to the specific socio-political and economic conditions, um, some of which have already been mentioned, the Kurdish women's movement was able to mobilize into a mass movement by arriving at certain conclusions, not just through theoretical debates, but in fact through actual lived experiences and practices, which not only created direct political consciousness, but also an attachment to uh, collectively finding solutions because this, these issues impacted people's lives directly so they had an interest in solving them in a collective manner. Thus, encouraged by Öcalan's suggestion to develop a scientific method that challenges the hegemonic understanding of the sciences, uh, especially the social sciences, um, one that does not simply categorize phenomena around humans and splits areas of life from each other in the form of myriads of different um, scientific branches. We have already heard a critique of scientism, but practically seeks to provide solutions to social problems. As uh, Havin mentioned yesterday, a sociology of freedom centered around the voices and experiences of the oppressed. The women's movement has been engaging in theoretical debates and proposed the concept of genealogy. And jin in Kurdish means woman, so genealogy could be translated as something like women's science or women's wisdom or women's knowledge or women's production of knowledge, something like that, because the term science is actually difficult to apply here because the very notion of science that exists in the current order is being challenged and criticized. So within the context of genealogy, um, which are basically discussions and debates in which women engage in, be it in the Kandil Mountains, um, in the heart of the Rojava Revolution, or in the neighborhoods in Diyarbakir, in Ahmed, questions such as how to reread and rewrite women's history, how is knowledge attained? What methods can be used in a liberationist quest for truth when today's science and knowledge productions have uh, taken knowledge away from us and served to maintain the status quo? These questions arise in uh, these discussions. And the deconstruction of patriarchy and other forms of subjugation, domination, and violence are in fact accompanied by, by discussions on the construction 
of alternatives based on liberationist values and solutions to freedom issues. Because these issues are not just social issues, but freedom issues. I need to, um, well, perhaps skip a few things. Um, well, um, okay. I'm going to improvise a little bit. Uh, the women's movement has in fact often been accused of um, appealing to the Neolithic age in a very romantic way, um, which can be problematic. But this is not the point that the women's movement is trying to do when referring to the Neolithic. In fact, um, instead of assigning a new social role with limited room for movement, uh, by researching history and history writing, genealogy tries to learn from ruptures in mythologies and religions to understand that communalist forms of organization in the Neolithic age uh, and investigate the relationships between means of production and social organization and the rise of patriarchy uh, with the emergence of accumulation and property. And yet, at the same time, they emphasize specific forms of oppression, specific forms of violence, such as the, um, women's um, uh, freedom problems, such as the patriarchy. In fact, the whole movement is around the autonomous organization of different groups. So, and I think we can find all kinds of examples of how the Kurdish women's movement tries to practically live this practice, rather than projecting it to a later date after the revolution. Within the Kurdish women's movement, women's liberation is not just an aim, it is an active practice, a method that is practiced on an everyday basis. It's not an, a thing that will be achieved in democracy, it is democracy in practice. So, um, and this requires a radical mentality uh, revolution in thought, because hegemony first establishes itself in thought. So. Um, Right, uh, I don't have much time, so I want to come to the important things that I want to say. Um, instead of putting, we, we can talk more in the question and answer session, obviously. Uh, instead of, you know, expecting justice from state-granted concepts such as legal rights, the women's movement, first of all, realizes we need a systemic critique. First of all, we need to identify what's wrong with the system in which we live in. And so, the burden must not be on women to solve their own issues. But this has to be the responsibility of the whole society, because by women's liberation, we measure the ethics and freedom of a society. So, um, by expecting any meaningful social change uh, through the mechanisms that perpetuate rape culture, such as the state, um, this would just mean to resort to liberalism with all of its feminist and democratic pretensions. And that's why I think a slogan in, that I've seen in Rojava quite a lot, we will defeat ISIS, the attacks of the Islamic State, by securing the liberation of women in the Middle East is quite telling of it. Because you do not defeat the Islamic State just militarily. You first of all have to defeat the mentality that underlies it. And in fact, that mentality not just exists in the Islamic State, but also partly in our own brains, in our own communities. Because the liberal, liberal state violence, the violence of the Islamic State, and honor killings within our community are actually not that different from each other. So, uh, one of the main things, one of the main objections is always, why does the women's movement have a male leader? Why is the a uh, leader of the Kurdish women's movement, um, a man. And I, I think, I mean, there's other things I want to say, but I think this is one of the biggest prejudices that need to be overcome. Because rather than fixating ourselves on Öcalan's maleness, perhaps we should ask ourselves what it means for a man in such a society, within such a movement, to have such a stance, to think of the whole system, the state system, the patriarchy, capitalism, from the perspective uh, of women's liberation. What does that mean? Perhaps this is exactly the radicalism that we need in order to solve our issues. So, 
those who are wondering whether the Kurdish women's movement is feminist or not, they should go to Rojava and see what is happening there. Now, in, there is an academy in Kamishlo, an academy of social sciences, in which a woman who is 70 years old teaches folk tales. And this is an attempt to challenge positivist science. The women who have not been able to read or write, now they participate in the economy, in TV programs. They run this revolution, and this will eventually defeat ISIS. And it's important to realize that this revolution is the legacy of uh, the philosophy of Abdullah Öcalan and the struggle of Kurdish women in 30-40 years of uh, resistance. So um, the women of Kobani have become an inspiration for the entire world because they have organized themselves autonomously, socially, militarily, culturally. and. Um, and we should ask ourselves within this context, what kind of feminism can be tolerated by the system and which one uh, cannot be to tolerated? We can have, my last point, uh, we can have um, a feminism, an imperialist feminism that can go out and justify wars in the Middle East in order to save the women. But on the other hand, we have women who are actually empowering themselves and who have radically given hope to the whole world and their ideologies on the list of terrorist organizations. We have to ask these questions and be clear what is driving these women, why are these women are, uh, fighting. They're not just doing that to save their homes. And, and my last sentence will be that we see uh, men who are explicitly raping, enslaving women who are engaging in an explicit feminicide against the women of the Middle East right now under the name of Islamic State. And on the other hand, we have women who are smiling and defending their values. And this sounds like a movie screen. This sounds like uh, a history that we would le read, you know, something from the past. But this is actually the real life. This is the world in which we live in. It is not a coincidence that these two lines are fighting against each other right now. This is very ideological. This shows us the real face of the system. And that's why I think... Uh, I just want to say that I'm very happy to belong to a generation uh, that no longer will need any myths because uh, one speaker had already said we no, don't need myths to ask for our rights, for our self-determination, for our independence, for our freedom. Uh, we just have to do it. And actually, I cannot think of any mythology, any religion, any story that can be more empowering than the women who are currently fighting in Kobani in order for our freedom, for everyone's freedom. And that's why I think we were all reborn with the resistance in Kobani. And that's why I would like to salute these women and thank you for your time.